Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode here on the Sticks and Bones Patreon with High Priestess Chelsea and Dr. Kellen Barger. And I want to give a warm welcome to the residents of the underworld, our Patreon members. We love you guys. Thanks for supporting us. Thanks for being here. Welcome. We are back with another episode. A fun one. I'm excited about this. We haven't spoken about magic in a while. No, we haven't. And ancient, you know, prehistoric in a sense, like we're going to go into it. I don't want to spoil anything, but like, this is something that, you know, of course, probably started as a superstition. When does it become magic? When does that term, you know, kind of, you know, catch on and everything. And I think it's an interesting concept and construct that we're going to be looking at today. Oh yeah. I'm excited. But like, before we do anything, we have to announce that this is the month where King Hades and Queen Persephone (laughs) come back reunite in the underworld together and we you know your girls have already been preparing we have in a minute we have so many announcements so like bear with us because you know september all the way to the december the end of the year this is our busiest time of year because there's so many things going on there's so many things and (laughs) welcome to the ancient month of bodramion we have the eleusinian cult that Mm -hmm. is starting back up again so yeah take it away chelsea what dates can people be expecting to look out for So I just want to say shout out to us because we have been working on this since the summer. Um, I want to remind you that sticks and bones is seasonal because we have to be, because it is our temple is dedicated to King Hades and Queen Persephone and Hecate. So this is a very special time of year. And these products that are coming out are very special to us. The courses, everything on Patreon, all of this is just, we we've been waiting for this uh, since summer hit. It was nice to take a little break, but like, we're ready to get We're ready the world. I'm shocked that it's already like September, like the six month time period has already like from March to September when it's like separate and everything. I'm just like, huh, well, we're back here again. Like it's shocking, but I'm ready for it. Oh yeah. And for all of you girlies out there and everyone's a girly here at six and Ones podcast, if you're wondering, Hey, how do I honor Queen Persephone? How do I honor King Hades during this time of year? I like Hikate. She's part of this too. What's going on? How do I know? Well, you come to the right place. And we're going to give you a few things that we have coming up that can really help you in mm-hmm. your practice and your life, help you understand the gods more. So first and foremost, we have our temple, big temple announcement, Six and Bones Temple, our temple to the gods. We are finally have Hades, Persephone, and Hikate in her propolis aspect today, right? We've changed the candle. Yes, she's getting changed. a new epithet, propolis, yes. <laughs> we changed Hikate with the movement of Persephone, and if you know, you know. If you don't, mm-hmm. you should definitely take the Hikate course because if you're worshiping her, you should know this. And if yeah. you don't, that's okay. We have a full-blown course. Check it out. <laughs> but King Hades, Queen Persephone, and Hikate are back in the store today. Queen Persephone is back in her queen of the underworld aspect, which we also changed seasonally. King Hades is just back in general. After (laughs) Aphrodite left the temple, he was like, is it clear? Can I come back? I don't want to be associated with love. Thanks. (laughs) Is Apollo gone? Is is my nephew gone? (laughs) I'll put him back in Tartarus. (laughs) So... They're back in our store today at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Get it while you can. Because like I said, this stuff's seasonal. So when spring rolls around, it's gone. It's King gone. Hades flees the temple and Hecate changes back to Propylaea. So and Persephone goes into the mortal realm to bring yes. about spring and allergies. And she goes yes. into her goddess of the spring. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're really excited. They're back at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, also, my Oracle of the Dead readings are back. I am not allowed to perform necromancy in the summer, but I am in the fall and the winter. So you can check those out. My services should be updated. Now, the biggest announcement of them all. This is what the girls wait for all year long at Sticks and Bones Temple. It is the fall. Because you know why? I'm telling you right now. No one does fall like we do. I don't care who you know, what metaphysical nope. store you buy from. You guys don't get it. No one does mystery boxes like we do. I'm dead ass serious. I I don't want to toot our own horn. No, we're tooting them. I think we were, we started, like, since we've been doing mystery boxes, there has been a mystery box explosion, depending on the seasons. Mm -hmm. And we are announcing our mystery boxes for the Halloween season today. Now, Mm -hmm. for those of you that are longtime sticks and bones devotees and followers... 
we changed things this year. We're not actually yeah. doing Halloween, but we are doing a mythological take on it because what better? Should I announce it or do you want to announce it? Uh, I'll lead you up. I'll do, okay. I'll do the kind of like, a, I feel like a, I have to include you, you know, cause I'll it's like, like a joint. Okay. So the thought was Halloween is so fun and like so personal and maybe Chelsea and I will get into our thoughts on like Halloween decorations this year in a bit, but we wanted to really embody, of course, seasons and everything, but take a darker take on mythology and all of that kind of stuff. Because if you didn't know, Samhain is a Celtic pagan holiday. So we were kind of like, uh, like you could kind of make the, the argument, well, it fits in like pagan Roman times because of Julius Caesar going over there. But it doesn't really fit sticks and bones, if you will. So we were thinking, you know, how are we going to make sticks and bones spooky for spooky season? And we decided on these two concepts that Chelsea's going to get into, but we really wanted it to be special to us and not just be like a hodgepodge of things that didn't make any sense culturally, historically, anything like that. We really wanted to pay homage, of course, to a specific archetype, but to ancient Greek religion as well. So Chelsea, without further ado, what are we doing so we are focusing heavily on medusa which no. i know <laughs> everyone's screaming right now because we haven't done medusa in a minute in a minute in the temple we did when we first started and i, I would say maybe we didn't do it too well because we were just starting out yes <laughs> like we, we could have done better yes yes Hands up, hands up. <laughs> we're also taking the archetype of a crone. And you're probably like, well, how do crones relate to ancient Greek religion? Well, there's a lot of crones in mythology. And one of them, the Witch of Erichtho, who is very popular, yeah. very familiar, terrifying. Um, we're really taking those concepts. And those are going to be our themes for the mystery boxes. Um, very excited. One thing I do want to say on top of what Ten is saying, I personally feel like it's weird to take our gods and associate them with things like Samhain and Halloween because they're not associated with those things. So we want to make sure we're being respectful. This still is ancient Greek religion mythology. This is part of the ancient world. And we are taking a really cool take on Medusa, which actually comes from a very specific piece of artwork that Ten and I looked at for like a half hour being like, is this the one? Is this the one? Is this the one? Because it was the one. It was the one. It was funny. It, we both came to it. Chelsea brought it up and I was like, I think it's by X artist. And the minds came together and yeah. developed this. And you know, we were like, okay, well, what is the art for the crown? So we have everything. Exclusive looks are going to be coming up on Patreon. And yeah, we can't wait to dive into more of specific details with you guys on next podcast. Yeah. And if you're new here at mystery boxes, we do them big. They come with these amazing candles. They are spelled for certain things. We have custom stuff that comes with it. That's associated with the topic. It's not just like crystals and just throwing things together for us. We really, really look at each specific piece, the oh. sense, everything behind it has a meaning and a purpose. The artwork, we started working on these literally in the summer because we were like, this yeah. is our biggest so much custom stuff so much custom sense custom artwork like ancient I mean, awesome. art is coming it's good and it's things you can use in your house in your practice like medusa is known for protection so that's what we're focusing on and yeah then we have the witch of eric though and the crone so it's we still have the air of halloween so we're excited anyway we talk about this all day mm -hmm. Just a light announcement. We'll give more information. Patreon will be getting sneak peeks of our artwork and everything and what it looks like um yeah, and that's that. And that's really all I have. That's really just a light temple update of, oh, by the way, here's all these crazy things coming out. Buckle up, because we have a lot of things coming out from now. The whole fall season is just, yes, it's crazy. But anyway. Do, do we want to give dates? Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. I forgot about the dates. I'm too excited about Patreon that I'm like, okay, <laughs> the dates. So our highest tier on Patreon, which is the Elysian tier, you will be getting early access to the mystery boxes, which is dropping Friday, September 27th times and, and logical details to follow. But we are giving this year, our Patreon, um, early access. So you'll have the weekend to shop the boxes and for everybody else, Monday, September 30th is when we'll be dropping all of the mystery boxes 
for the Halloween season, the quote unquote fall season. So everyone will have access to that. And we will post follow sticks and bones, temple, Instagram, um, TikTok, me and 10, uh, to follow with updates. So yeah, those are the dates. Mark one calendar. So excited. I'm so excited for this one. I don't know why. And then spoiler chelsea and i have already been looking at like the end of the year collection for winter solstice we and already figured already, it out we already have it figured we already it out. have it and like i'm, I'm already like it's i want to just so... tell everybody right now <laughs> you guys have no idea how good the winter collection i know we don't even launch the fall collection but the winter collection you're gonna be like how did you think of this and we're gonna be like we don't know we're just we're just we don't know too many years of art history being like i got yelled at too much about this piece i have to do it justice now <laughs> okay We have to carry on. So next announcement, and then I promise you guys we'll get to the episode, but these are all fun things. If you want to join a nice community, if you want to buy some nice artwork, things that are historically and factually correct for your practice and your worship and the gods, or maybe you like myths, we have some exciting announcements for Patreon. Yes, we do. And of course, with Patreon, we are continuing our book club series. Of course, this month we are doing... Medusa's sisters in honor of Medusa herself inspiring part of our fall collection we are going to be reading chapters 1 through 19 for the month of September October will be chapters 20 through 38 so gird your loins because we are so excited about this book needed a different take we we love Song of Achilles you know our thoughts about Cersei and now we're diving into you know mythological monsters and creatures so super excited about that and Chelsea said it best the queen is coming she is back in the underworld Persephone returns we are doing a deep dive episode on her on Patreon we are talking about her mystery cult with the site of Eleusis and the top tier you guys are getting some new goodies in the temple treasury to go along great with those statues that you guys have of course you guys will be getting exclusive access to behind the scenes content of us prepping and doing <laughs> mystery boxes we already started the and blog. <laughs> persephone is getting her own blog so stay tuned for all of this good stuff because the queen is back and we couldn't be happier that's what I'm saying. Why go anywhere else? We have all the things you need here. Everyone thinks it's so hard to do ancient Greek religion and worship of the gods. And it's like, oh, we have your back. So don't worry. Um, But yeah, so check out the temple. Check out Patreon. We're welcoming the queen home. And yeah, that's that's really all the announcements I have. Do you have anything else you need to say? I'm like out of breath. I feel like um, <laughs> I'm on QVC. You know, <laughs> Vanna White, if you will. <laughs> or I feel like we're hosting like camp, you know, like the camp counselors come out with like the itinerary for the day. I'm like, we're actually really organized people when I think about it. There, that's a lot of clapping, a lot of, a lot of laughing and smiling. And it's not for me, man. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. I'm like, I feel like a camp counselor, like, ready? Okay, campers. Queen Persephone is home. Grab your brooms. We have to sweep the temple because it's dirty. I have left in a mess. Of- the camp counselors from the second Adams family. That's us. <laughs> right? <laughs> Ready camp counselors. Ready campers. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You can only be a camper if you're on Patreon. That's a cult member. <laughs> True. You gotta be cult part of the member. mystery cult, man. Cult member, camper, same thing, right? Mystery People that cult. go to camp. Go mystery ahead. cult summer camp. People that go to camp come back. Like they've been in a cult. You know what I'm saying? I've never gone to summer camp. I only went to day camp. That was like nine to five down the street from my house. I never, I, we didn't have, we, my mom never put me in like night camp, stay away camp. I always wanted Mm -hmm. to do it, but I had friends that did it and, um, it's a cult following, but it seems very nice. Like in a good way of like, you know, maybe I'll consider it one day if I have kids, you're going to sleep away camp and you're going (laughs) to like it. Start threatening our cats like that. Pluto, you don't want to You're going to sleep away camp. Let me tell you, I had a clip Pluto's nails today. You would have thought that I was murdering him in the kitchen. Okay? I was like, mommy's going to put you in air, air jail. Okay? You're going to be in big trouble. <laughs> Why are they? He has to go to sleep away camp. You might have to put him in like a bag and cut out holes for his like feet to dangle out and then just hold him up and then just clip him that way. Let me tell you, I've tried everything. People are like, throw a towel in the dryer and make it hot and then wrap them like a burrito. Do you know I tried that? And he was so pissed. You know, Iroh's pretty good. Um, Kevin will hold and I will 
push out his nails like Wolverine and then I'll like clip them. But I'm always terrified that I'm just going to nick him. And that is my yes. biggest fear. I've done, I've done that. Kevin has done that to his dogs, like when he was clipping their nails. And I'm like, I, I think I would just cry. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, the way Pluto yells, you would think I had nicked him when I had only just taken like a sh- a little tiny bit off the top because I'm so scared he's going to fly out of my hands. And I'm like, yep. near the vet, pick your choice. Anyway, maybe I should send him to camp. Okay, we have to start today's episode. <laughs> we have to get started. We have so much to talk about today. And as Chelsea said earlier, we are covering, well, we're getting back into our ancient magic nonsense. So we are coming at you with some magic mythology and more and you know what are we talking about chelsea we are talking about not magic and you're probably like what is so great about not magic well i'll tell you as the folk early of this episode knots you know how many things you can do with just a knot this is why i love ancient magic folk practice i talk about this all the time on my account of how like you don't need to do a huge seance in your living room to to do something you know like it's fine if you want to do that sometimes i'm like hey i want to be one of those like fortune tellers with the crystal balls and like i want to do that but not magic can either protect you mess you up Um, It can actually mess up workings. It can mess up your everyday life with knots. It can mess up birthing and fertility. And what's beautiful about this is Ten is talking about ancient Rome and ancient Rome, like we say all the time here, directly influences my folk practice. And so we're kind of going to be going, um, Ten will be sharing something. I will be sharing something. And it's like, it lines up almost perfectly because of the influences, if you will. Oh, yeah. One is going to go into the other with tradition, history, all of that kind of stuff. So while we love ancient Greece, ancient Rome also slaps. Not just yeah. the Roman Empire, but like the ancient Roman religion, period, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So without further ado, join me as we open up our mythology books to Ovid's Metamorphosis. And we are looking at our gal pal, Minerva, smiting down a mortal girl. That's right. We're talking about Minerva and Arachne. So, of course, Minerva is the Roman embodiment of Athena, who is the Greek goddess of war, wisdom, screaming daughter of Zeus. And she is the inventor and patron deity, if you didn't know, of weaving, embroidery, crafts, and other aspects, which many of these are skills which women in classical antiquity learned and practiced in their own home, especially if you were of the upper class. You were taught from a young age how to use a loom. You had to create masterpieces. You had to. You had that to. was, you were going to be a good wife if you could, you know, do a thing or two on the loom. You know what? Bring back the loom. I actually was thinking about this of like, I feel like as people, we've really lost a lot of these like really amazing craftsmen, craft pieces and the craftsmanship behind it. And I'm like, oh, like lace making. Oh my, oh my God. Have you ever seen those videos? Those women move so fast. I want to learn. I wish I knew. I wish I had a grandmother that like did lace making. Um, My family, we only crochet, but I'm like, mm. imagine if you had a loom or something and was like creating something just beautiful. Or like if I got in an argument with Kevin, I would just like walk away with like a cape and just go to my loom. Like, <laughs> you know what? Watch me next week have a loom on the podcast and be like, I've <laughs> I have no idea what to do with this. I've invested thousands of dollars in it. Someone help. It's the loom of Daedalus. <laughs> oh my God. Please. Speaking of Cersei, we did that book review on Patreon. Yeah. Check it out. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> so as a goddess, Minerva expected, of course, the usual adoration and devotion from those who worshipped her, especially those who were gifted in the art of spinning. Arachne was a poor country girl, and she was known far and wide as a wondrous weaver. However, she was also hella egotistical and boastful, Mm -hmm. claiming that even she was superior to Minerva. Yikes. We know what happens when you compare yourself to a goddess. Don't do it. Don't do it. Many actually thought that she had been gifted and blessed by the goddess herself, yet she would reply, ha! Minerva has taught me nothing. That was a crone cackle right there. (laughs) I love that. I'm better than Minerva, a a whole ass goddess. Minerva has taught me nothing. I have learned it all myself. Offended, the goddess dressed up as an old hag and went to Arachne to warn her against her hubris. Basically, take a razor scooter to her ankle and humble her. 
but nothing phased Arachne, who only slightly blushed when Minerva revealed herself to not be a hag, but to be the goddess herself. Far from giving credit to the goddess as the source of her skill, and unmindful of the danger posed by being in the presence of an angry god so close by, this foolish young girl challenged Minerva to a duel, a looming Olympics. In Ovid's tale, when both are finished with their furious loom-making and fabricating, Arachne has indeed won the contest, as even the goddess Envy could not pick out a flaw in her work. For she weaved scenes of the gods and goddesses along with their adventures with a beautiful floral border. Minerva, on the other hand, had spun pictures of puny mortals turned into various creatures after defying the gods' warning, an admonition literally woven into every corner. Basically, she wove, you are mortal, we are gods, here's what happens when you upset the balance, basically. Sometimes in mythology, depending on the translation, it will just say that she just depicted the 12 gods and goddesses just in their might and really didn't give them depth, in a sense. But the nymphs were literally awestruck by Arachne and their adventures that she depicted, and they were like, she she won, like, sorry, sorry, Minerva, girl beat you. So, as Ovid heads into the following passage, the question that lingers in the reader's mind is what web of retribution has the arrogant Arachne spun for herself? So he writes, the golden-haired goddess felt pain at the outcome, and she broke down the embroidered cloth depicting divine crimes. And as she held the shuttle from the mountain, 12 times Minerva struck the forehead of Arachne. The unlucky girl did not suffer the insult. With a noose, she bound her throat proudly. Feeling pity, Minerva lifted her up, hanging her, and said thus, Live then, yet hang, presumptuous girl, and let the same condition of penalty, lest you be carefree about the future. Be set for your offspring and distant descendants. After these things, as the goddess was departing, she suddenly sprinkled Arachne with the juices of an infernal herb and a poisonous drug. Can I stop you for one second? Mm-hmm. Okay, I think I'm lost. Um, and I wonder if other people listening might be lost as well, because I know this is like coming from Ovid. Mm-hmm. And I sometimes do not understand people's <clears throat> English. What what did she strike her in the head for? Because I'm listening and I'm like, I think I might have missed that you part. Lost. So... Arachne, a up, mortal girl, yeah, boasting hubris, won against a goddess. Right, crowned the winner. Minerva didn't take likely to that. Right, and so she is she hanging. She her? Grabbed the shuttle from the loom that okay. shoots back and forth, beats her to a bloody pulp, and okay. out of there shame. There we go. Now I now I'm following you. Out of shame, Arachne crawls away on the floor as a bloody pulp and she's trying to tie a noose to basically off herself right so that she can st- like stop this punishment so minerva grabs her and the noose and as she's hanging her in her by her throat Jeez. is basically cursing her okay and then drops this herb on her and okay, then as I- she walks out she is casting her goddess ways i got the the hanging part but i don't know if it was just me i was missing the getting beat i guess for lack of a better term nope she got she got her ass beat <laughs> handed yeah. to her so as she's sprinkling this juice of an infernal herb she touches arachne's hair and as she touches her hair arachne's hair flows away and with them both her nose and ears And her head becomes very small. She is also small in her whole body. Slender fingers cling onto her side in place of legs. Her belly occupies the rest from which, nevertheless, that girl lets out a thread. And the spider works her ancient looms. So after Mm -hmm. Minerva basically puts herbs on her and says her words and puts a curse on her, she leaves and... She is transforming 
legs sprout out from her abdomen, which is a thorax Mm -hmm. and legs are gone and she shrinks down. And since she is going to be the best weaver possible, well, now you and your descendants will always weave. That's just terrible. That is absolutely terrifying. But because this is coming from Ovid's metamorphosis, which talks a lot about people transforming and everything. It's really interesting because looking at ancient Greco-Roman culture, history, all of that kind of stuff, and the lessons taught by ancient Greco-Roman religion, it is really interesting that he chose to highlight almost a divine evil eye in a sense and really shows the smackdown that is going to follow if you challenge a god and if you do not like understand your place in the whole cosmos in a sense but if you are like what the hell is a divine evil eye and the gods can give it to humans yes yes and more and it's funny chelsea and i actually dove into that heavily in the evil eye course so if you're like i need to know what else not to do check out the evil eye course oh yeah i mean gods definitely there's many myth- myths of gods being envious of humans and like what it, sometimes it's just really not your fault <laughs> <laughs> but actually too it's not only in i know we talk a lot about the greco-roman world but i do um study a lot of irish folklore and there's also um stories of the fae basically taking like the best humans into the fey world and not letting them go because they want them to like compete in their worlds and they're like well this this human being is really good at this and now they must stay here and it's like sometimes it doesn't pay to be good at your job you know like when you're good at your job and you like get all the work and and you're no pay (laughs) basically so it does it does happen it does happen and it it kind of depends like you could just be like the most beautiful like there was there's a man who was the most beautiful after adonis and zeus takes him to be his cupbearer and for other things and you're just like oh my gosh but then you have arachne who's literally challenging the goddess of crafts and it's like there's such a large spectrum that it's just like oh i'm just gonna suck (laughs) Or sometimes they take you to keep them close to them so that you don't act out of line because you are good at something or they are just envious of you and they're like, well, she works for me. Or this is, you know, I own her basically. She has the favor of me. And it's like, "Mm." I feel like they just pick them and they're like, oh, like Zeus, I'm blanking on the mortal's name. Who's the most beautiful that he takes. And it's just like, oh, look at him. I will take him and I will put him on my shelf there you, you put him sit. in my pocket such a you shiny can you could sit right next to me like because <laughs> it makes zeus look good you know what i'm saying like i feel like a lot of this is just like the gods having trophy cases yes of, of like, course instead of like trophies it's humans <laughs> have have you guys been listening to us as we talk about <laughs> greek mythology it's like <laughs> just uh You know, we talked a lot in um book club about odysseus and like how <sighs> we had athena's favor but like how sometimes that turns out not to be great so anyway we're getting a little off track but i divine evil eye real thing it's talked about in the evil eye course check it out if you're like what are you talking about i had no idea these gods did these things you should you should know you should know you know especially if you're worshiping them um doesn't mean it's gonna happen to you but it's good to (laughs) yeah you're not gonna be you're not gonna turn into a spider but it's like it's good to know about the gods you worship and their myths because it's like oh maybe i shouldn't challenge anyone to a weaving competition maybe and yeah, it, it definitely not. It's crazy because you go from like weaving and like how spiders are made, and it's really kind of like talking about, you know, why are things the way that they are? Because of course, spiders weave beautiful webs, but knots and weaving and all of that kind of stuff really also showcases in ancient Roman life, ancient Roman culture, ancient Roman religion, because. If we're going to look at, you know, fertility and birth in the ancient world, that was basically life and death situations Mm -hmm. at its best, not only for the mother, but for the child. And the biggest thing for so many women was making sure that your womb was open to allow for the baby to make it out. Because fun fact, doctors weren't called in until things got bad. You were with your midwives and they were trained and they were professionals, but like things were not good if the doctor had to come in. So with that being said, knots during birth, you had to take them out 
loose your hair with like knots as in like braids and everything. So you had to make sure your hair was streaming, any knots on your clothing, your sandals. If you had lace sandals back in the day, you had to undo those puppies because any knot on your body, it could cause your womb to knot up and it could cause the baby to be stuck. No baby's coming out if everything's stuck. But it's also interesting that after the successful birth of a baby, mothers would actually leave offerings at the temple to Juno Lokina. And by doing so at certain festivals to her, they would do the same things to honor her for allowing their baby to come through, loose your hair, take out all your knots. And it's just so interesting that like you go from beautiful creatures who spin looms and everything to women trying to bring life into the world. And to do so, you have to make sure it's a straight shot. Oh yeah. I mean, we talked about this before the um, podcast, but like knots is some of the oldest form of superstition and magic because everyone gets knots in their hair, especially if you have long hair, you get knots in your back, your neck. I think I have one right now, to be honest with you from all the stress, I probably have a huge knot in my back that I have to get worked out. But, um, speaking of like Roman, uh, traditions and superstitions, It translates exactly into Italian folk practice because like you said, when women are giving birth in Italian superstition and practice, you will find that people are brushing their hair out before they are ready to give birth because it is said if you have a knot on your body, it's going to knot either the umbilical cord or it's Mm. not going to allow for passageway for the baby to come through. And in Italian superstition, there's a heavy emphasis on the umbilical cord, getting tied around the baby's neck, getting tied into a knot, the way that the baby is placed so that it comes out of the, you know, has a straight shot to come out. Like, is it turned a specific way? Mm-hmm. And so um, things Italian folk women do or used to do rather, I know I do this, like when I have family members that are getting ready to give birth, we will make sure that um, you'll find people like massaging them to make sure that all the knots are out of their body and actively mm-hmm. brushing their hair yep, and saying prayers to Mary. Um, also, Kibli is another one, ensuring that the child comes out without any issues. Even in modern day, people do that. So it's very interesting. And it also translates to in my folk practice. Um, I just, for my ghost whisperer Patreon, you guys, for those of you that are over there, we just talked about this before I cleanse my space. You have to brush your hair out. It has to be out of braids, out of a bun, whatever it's in, you have to brush everything out. And some women even, or practitioners, I should say, will go bare chested throughout their house Mm. in order to just be bare and have nothing in the way. So that makes sense. It does for sure. And even when, uh, with childbirth as well, um, you'll often find women are bare chested in order to make sure there's no knots in terms of breast milk that you're able to produce, right? Because especially in ancient times, you know, they didn't have formula. So if you couldn't produce milk, how are you feeding your kid? Right. A wet nurse. <laughs> Exactly. So the knots are so, so symbolic and, um, you can use these superstitions in modern day of like, maybe you're giving birth or someone, you know, is giving birth and you're like, Hey, that's a good idea and a good practice just as like a a little superstition, um, in order to get the baby out easier. Yeah. I would take this one more as a superstition because it's coming out of like ancient Roman religion and religious practices for like Juno Lokina and everything. And other goddesses who were invoked during childbirth so this one yeah it it wouldn't fall under magic because so many people were doing it and it wasn't going against or changing the divine will of the gods you were just doing it to help you help your child all of that kind of stuff yeah it's definitely not it's definitely not magic get it (laughs) um but the only time i would say in my instance it is magic is when you are using specific certain prayers to invoke a magical presence of something. Yes. But the act of just brushing your hair in order to ensure there's no knots during childbirth, definitely superstition. And we teach a lot about superstition because it's something that's easily adaptable into your everyday life. You don't have to be a sorceress or a witch or initiate into a folk practice. You can just simply take mm-hmm. these things and use them and they do work. So- Oh yeah. I think it's, it's so important to like iterate that, like, this is why people were doing it of ancient, for Mm -hmm. this case, for the Roman pantheon, the Roman religion. Um, but in ancient Greco-Roman 
religion, yeah, they were not so much like evoking the presence, but calling upon, um, you know, the goddesses of childbirth yeah. being like, please help. So not invoking their presence, but it's so interesting because it's just like, you're asking for help and you are doing all of the proper instructions laid out before you to make sure things go smoothly in a way. Well, I'll tell you this. My mom clearly didn't do any brushing of her hair because I came out with the umbilical cord wrapped around my neck and I almost died. So (laughs) I was blue. They like, my mom told me I was her first child and she, her water broke. She didn't realize the umbilical cord was around the neck and they had to take me, like she said, you were blue and just wailing away. And I didn't even get to hold you after birth because they had to give you oxygen. You were blue. I'm like, that's great, mom. You clearly maybe should have brushed your hair. I didn't, I didn't cry when I was born. Oh, I was just asleep, like swimming around. I, my mom had so much fluid in there and she was like, that's why you're a swimmer now. But I was, I was born a few weeks early. They induced my mom and yeah, I just didn't cry. My mom was like, she's fine. And can we focus on like patching me back up, please? Like she is fine, please. (laughs) Like maybe let's look back at Pilar. (laughs) This is why maybe that says something about, the way you're born. I don't know. And Italian folk practice too. Um, Italian folk women will actually like do divination on how the baby is sitting because remember back in the day, don't have ultrasound. So like yeah, yeah. asking <laughs> saints and La Madonna <laughs> and their ancestors are like, can you tell me how the baby is sitting so I can inform the midwife so that we can help because they don't have the technology to like take a look. So they're really re- relying. And, and like 10 said, childbirth is dangerous during this time period you either like you most likely didn't live in some instances and or if the baby could have something wrong with it um so yeah even today too like italian folk women will do divination on not only if the baby can practice magic but also where it's sitting in the womb and how and are there any knots blocking the way so knots are important not not only very important in birth (laughs) not only in birth but in other stages of your life as well. And, you know, if we're growing up as an ancient Roman, you know, you grow up, you make it past the first five dangerous years of your life. You're probably going to make it, but you make it to marriage. Cool. We're all getting married now. As a bride, you were required to have a special knot wrapped around you, tied around you on the wedding dress and veil that you made yourself. It had to also be yellow. Um, but you had to wear this on your big day and you had to sleep in your wedding dress the night before. The knot was thought to be difficult to undo and symbolized both fertility by reference to uh, Hercules's 70 children and chastity as it was to only be undone by your new husband on the wedding night. And it resembled not only the binding together of two individuals in marriage, but also the binding of the bride's chastity and her fertility to her husband. So by undoing that knot, your fertility is now bada bing, bada boom. I love that. That's serving. It's giving. The girls were serving back in ancient Rome with their knots and their chastity and being like, this is only for my husband. There's something so beautiful about that of like, listen, I'm pro do what you want, but I also really (laughs) love the I really love the aspect of like sometimes people waiting for marriage and like, it's just like such a beautiful concept, you know, love it until I remember that Roman grooms could get married in absentia, which is the bride literally went to the wedding by herself, walked to her husband's house and was just doing it alone. And then I'm like, "Mm." (laughs) never mind then. That's terrible. (laughs) Yeah. It usually happened if like the man was like in military service. Aww. Well, we can't blame him. He had to go to war. Yeah, he had Men to. were going to war and women were tying knots for chastity. Ancient Rome in a nutshell. <laughs> and then you have the Vestal Virgins happening at the same time. No. Well, Ooh. and the black beans and the black beans. And the black beans and the lararium's and yeah, all the fun stuff. Stepping outside right foot first. And if you didn't, like bad shit would happen. Like but this is all superstition, by the way. This is not even magic. I'm getting to no. the magic part next, but no, this I is all love- superstition. I love sharing superstition because like I said, it's just open for anybody. Like if you believe in it, it exists. So like there we go. Well, speaking <laughs> of um superstition, I'll start with my superstition and then I'm leaving you guys on a cliffhanger. I'm getting a curse and hexing and knots. Don't worry about it. Yes. But one superstition that 
is big with the evil eye when you've been hit with Molochial is that a knot will actually appear in your evil eye bracelet or sometimes your necklaces that are specifically for protection. This happens to me all the time. I think literally once every two months I call 10 and I'm like, can you get this knot out of my evil eye bracelet? And she's like, what, what now? And I'm like, I don't know. I probably went to go no. visit a family member and they went, I'm and gonna shoot you it. have to know, like, not just be a Girl Scout or a Boy Scout and, like, no knots, but, like, you have to, like, I've had to get needles involved to, like, open things up and then figure out how was it knotted because that will also tell you a lot. <laughs> Divination, yeah. Um, also, did you have the knot before or after you went to this gathering or you stepped outside? So this is your friendly reminder to take our evil eye course at Six of Bones University. Ten talks about it in the ancient way. I talk about it in the Italian folk way. I teach you all of the symbols and amulets you can wear. Um, what does it look like to cure evil eye and all that fun stuff? But that's another superstition. So if you find a knot in your mm -hmm. evil eye bracelet, you know, people will email Wrong. us all the time. Like <laughs> I lost um, this specific protection charm on a candle that you guys made. I, we used to sell evil eye bracelets. Maybe we will again in the future. I oh. have a knot in my, I lost my evil eye bracelet. It protected you from something. You have to understand the charms and symbols you're wearing because they are reacting in certain ways. We get those emails all the time. And I'm like, girls, girls, it's because you were wearing Medusa. What is the iconography? Why do you know why you're wearing this symbol? That's why I got lost. It what is the symbol you. and what is it used for? You start doing pop quizzes. <laughs> <laughs> you come to the temple and if you don't, I'm going to hit you with the broom. That's it. Get out. I'm just going to open up every podcast with like an image and be like, what is this image? What is it used for? <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Anyway, and last, but most certainly not least, oh my the God. magical uses of knots and knots are the, one of the oldest forms of magic. You can find it cross culture so anywhere. The witch's knot is really big. That's been around for a very long time. Knots. So in Italian folk, we actually use knots to not only hex people, but to curse them. You know I why? Mean, because when you're tying a knot, you're binding things. You are tying them so that they can't get out. Mm -hmm. So they're used very heavily in love magic, um, which. Shocker. You could take knots many of different ways. You can use knots for protection mm -hmm. um, of creating something that's so strong that people don't know how to undo. You can use knots in hexing. Now, let me tell you, in Italian folk practice, we use our own poppets, which a lot of people like to just associate with voodoo, but it's used. We use dolls, um, certain types of poppets in order to curse and hex people with pins. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, Chelsea, that's not a knot. You can take those pins and cause knots on people with certain yeah. prayers. So um, my dad always tells the story of my great aunt. Oh, no. This was her daughter-in-law. Uh, she did this for her daughter-in-law. She took a poppet and like her daughter-in-law's boss was bothering her at work. So everyone runs to the Italian folk woman. And they're like, what can you do for me? Because my boss is pissing me off. It's like unbearable, especially being a woman at work. Like he just was like harassing her and mm -hmm. you know, in the eighties, yeah, there was no HR. <laughs> no. So my aunt took her poppet and actually put it on the forehead of the poppet, said a few different prayers. My, um, my aunt went to work the next day and he had a huge knot on top of his head. <laughs> It was caused by my aunt. And she was like, I didn't think Aunt Jean's magic worked until I went to work the next day. And this man had told me, like, he had gotten into some accident and had a knot on top of his head. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't work for, like, the whole week. So. Sorrows. Right. Sorrows. <laughs> Sorry, we feel so bad for you. But it's kind of interesting because, like, is, like, if you said a prayer and it happened, is it just justice or is it a curse? Like, that's when you get into, like, the, like whole like gray philosophy area which I love like to have those kind of discussions but it's so interesting of like huh I was it gonna happen Who I think like? for Italian folk magic we get away with a lot of things because it technically could fall under curses so like Saint Michael is the big time with the evil eye Malocchio and obviously you wouldn't be mixing some sort of superstition and magic with a saint, but he's also a defender of the innocent. So like if we're evoking him or calling or saying specific prayers to take the evil eye out, there's two different ways you could do it. Is it magic or is it he's just protecting you? 
it's divine justice, you know, like divine just- see, that's why we get away with it. But it's interesting because if it's not, <laughs> not is if it's <laughs> magic in the ancient sense, like that's why people were so weary of it because it was going against what the gods wanted. But maybe, maybe Michael was like, nah, you're getting a hit on the head. Like, well, so it's so interesting because it's like, was it? Was it like, yeah, you know what? You effed up. You deserve this like cause effect kind of deal. Well, Catholics believe in, I guess would kind of like we're we're taught to go to saints to ask for things. So like, I don't but like, so God's busy. <laughs> this is a practice, by the way, Italian folk practice. It's not religion. So once again, two different things, but the belief behind it is you go to a saint to ask for things and saints are supposed to answer you if they want to. So it's we do kind of change things for ourselves, but we're taught to do that of like, oh, you lost an item. You should go to St. Anthony. You got to go ask him. We don't like believe that God has like this. We're, we're going against his fate, if you will, with certain things. It's like, oh, we'll just go to a saint to fix it. No, but it's like you're going for help. And if it's, cor- yeah, if it's you're help. correct or like you're innocent or like it's just, then it makes sense because that's not magic no magic. it's technically not no it's not not <laughs> magic that's why italian folk practice is so awesome because it hides under you it's like depends on what you believe it's not is it magic i mean it is in some instances when you take that lemon into church on christmas eve but it also is just you asking saint michael because you have that right of italian folk passage you were it's passed down through your ancestors those those spirits walk with you from birth and <laughs> You're helping people. And if Michael was going to do it, then like. You're helping. People. I wouldn't consider that magic. Like I would be like, I'm I'm that's, that's divine retribution, my guy. It like, is, <laughs> it's a very fine line. And that's why I don't even like saying folk witch because it's not witchcraft, but there's no good way to categorize it. So it's like, anyway, this is a bigger conversation. Maybe when we get to our magic episode, we'll talk more about it, which is our grand episode, I'm sure, of the year. But yeah, it's a very fine line between superstition, like we always say, magic, Mm -hmm. what's divine intervention and retribution, uh, et cetera. And I think Catholicism is one of those outliers where it's different because Christianity is like God takes care of it. Because it's like, yeah, because then I'm thinking like, well, with Catholicism, it's petitions. And some instances in like ancient Greco-Roman practices, you are petitioning, petitioning for X, Y, and Z to happen for curse tablets, but then some are just like straight like curse tablets. Like, so there's yeah. it's always like a sliding scale, which I always find yes. interesting, especially with knots, because there have been multiple curse tablets um that have knots inscribed on them to make sure that one, it's never opened or yeah. releases said demone or shade from basically like their contractual agreement or there's um a few instances of knots occurring in the greek magical papyri which of course is incomplete and doesn't come from antiquity but um (laughs) i love that we always have to say that anytime we bring it up it's it's not ancient greek uh it's Uh, more roman it's like second through fifth century something like that um but with that i think that there's like one not even 10% 10% complete portion of the spell, but it calls for 365 knots. Damn, and I'm like, damn, knots. like how, how much fabric does that person like have to go? See, through? but also magic isn't easy. Um, you want something done correct. And I think we're like gearing up for the magic episode. It's not just like, I will just light this one white candle. And now this person is binded for 365 days. Tea. No, if you're talking <laughs> about ancient magic and you want things done instead of this fluffy foo-foo, you need to do the work. You have to go get the goat's tongue and you better get the the toad outside and stuff your hair in it. Like it's your yarn. Like we gotta start knotting shit. Like <laughs> we gotta start today if we're gonna do this. Like, or we gotta be done by next week. We gotta go. <laughs> you know, if someone enlisted me, I'd be like, who are we binding and why? And do they deserve it? Because if they do, I'm hopping on this knot train. The girls, yeah, that's it. Chelsea takes one side, I take the other, we meet in the middle. <laughs> we're sitting outside the temple knotting things. And if you see us, don't ask, don't Bunch tell. business. <laughs> Mind your business. I'll get the room. But no, it's it's so interesting <laughs> with like knots and everything. And then even in like artwork and iconography and symbolism, like knots itself or like the binding with rope is also super symbolic of binding it together. And on Dirt Diaries Patreon, I went into like incantation bowls 
that show people binding a demon with knots and rope and the sorcerers doing it. And it's like, we have this. And this is from modern Iraq. And it's like, it is so widespread. Yep. (laughs) I don't know why, but when I was doing research on that bull, I just imagined like this ancient Iraqi like sorcerer with like a lasso, like ready to just lasso this like demon. (laughs) Let me tell you, I had to do one exorcism on someone's home once and Michael looked at me and said, get the yarn because we were tying knots because I had to bind it so it would stay in place. So Michael, St. Michael would then have to exit it. But he was like, no, you're going to do the work first. You're going to lasso him like a pig. You're going to bind him to this candle. (laughs) Hear me out. And then we exercise it. That's like the whole thing. It's like, it's, yeah, I think you said it perfectly. Like, it's not like a white candle and like no. I don't even know because I'd be like that ain't that that candle's going right. I out. just you know it just came into mine did go out when I was doing the it said I no I actually took a video of it the flame went out it went <laughs> I had like two I had five candles going at once like so if it like tried not to get binded to one it would have to go to the other but anyway another story for another day but I just envisioned in my head like an empty like wooden chair and you know like in the interrogation rooms when you're like you're. <laughs> So you have to, you have to like, when you're interrogating someone and you have to tie them to the chair, just like invisible, like an invisible chair with yes. a person sitting in it and you're tying them up. That's all I thought of. Knots. Anyway. Knots really just doing it for everybody. Is it superstition? Is it magic? Is it, what is it? It's a gotta job. I'll broom. tell you that. It's Gotta get job. the broom. Gotta get the rope. That's gotta get it. the dirt. Gotta get the beans. That's it. <laughs> You know, you guys really, I'm telling you right now, like you learned so much from this podcast. It's just black beans to get rid of ghosts. Like we need like to write a book, a how to, you need to get the rope. You got to get the rope. Okay. We got to start to clatter bronze. (laughs) That's it. That's it. Anyway, I don't think I could talk about knots anymore. I do not have anything. I do not. Yeah, I'm out of I'm out of knots, so not another word, truly. <laughs> but with that being said, we will see you guys next time on Sticks and Bones podcast to the residents of the underworld. We will be seeing you this month to talk about Queen Persephone, talk about her mystery cult, and of course, Eleusis, you are getting first access to the mystery boxes. Check out the Persephone blog, everybody. Don't forget to set your alarms for mystery boxes public mystery boxes launching on September 30th. Join us for book club as we dive into Medusa's sisters and learn about the world of the Gorgons. And with that being said, don't forget to listen to Ghost Whisper Dirt Diaries. Check out Ghost Whisper and Dirt Diaries Patreon. Check out all of our courses. We have so many trinkets in the store. We have so many cool things. It's fall. It's spooky season. Come along this journey with us and we will see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.